We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Los Angeles. I'm very pleased to have Abe Most with me, who is a clarinetist who's put in quite a few years in all kinds of different musical settings. So welcome. It's Thank a pleasure. You. Thank you, Mark. I understand you're a transplanted uh, New Yorker. Yes. Yeah. Uh, started born in Manhattan, then uh, we vacillated back and forth from the Bronx to Atlantic City, back to the Bronx. Hmm. And uh, that was about it. Last I remember, we were back in the Bronx, and my brother, who had taken the uh, my my old instruments, clarinet, flute, etc. And uh, I was out on the road, and he took over uh -huh. the local whatever you take over yeah. locally. You know. What would, what was your father's profession? He was a cap maker. Uh, I wouldn't even say tailor. He made you know these little nowadays. I guess they're specialty caps. You know the little visor and. A cap, mm. and he'd occasionally bring me one, mm -hmm. and that was, I, I don't really know exactly, it's funny, I would like to have seen what he did, but right. after all these years, what did yeah. you do? I made caps, but uh, <laughs> uh, I know he made these because he'd bring them home once in a while. Well, they certainly had musical children. Were, were they musical at all? Uh, uh, yes, but not professionally. Uh, my father wound up being the cantor of a small uh, synagogue. This was years and years later. He'd always wanted to do that sort of thing. And uh, he called himself, I called him a cantor, but it was like a congregation of about maybe 20 people. No, he was the fellow who did the yeah. uh, liturgical work, the, so he was the cantor for the the group, but that, that was his pride and joy. I mm -hmm. remember he really used to like to do that. And my mother sang a little bit, just to the kids. Mm -hmm. and the other, the other kids uh, were musical in a way. My brother, we have three brothers and two sisters. Bernie, my youngest brother, likes to play guitar and sing a little bit. And Sam, of course, that's the uh, middle brother. Yeah. He's a twin, you know, and oh. uh, but she, uh, Ruth, his twin, wasn't into music. The other sister, which is uh, Fran, uh, sings a bit. She likes to sing, mm -hmm. and that takes care of the family. Yeah. So Sam and I are the only professionals, let's right. call them. Bernie likes to do it. What led you, directed you to swing music at that time? You know, it's hard to think of one thing, but what stands out is I remember hearing Benny Goodman and that clarinet and the band and the whole bit, and that turned me on the swing. And then I heard Artie Shaw, and that really did it. Uh -huh. And don't ask me which is <laughs> <laughs> yeah. best. I got stories that I tell when I do concerts. Who they say who? Who's, well, what does he do and what does he do? Uh, but they're both excellent. You know, it's like apples and oranges. Yeah. They're both so terrific. Right. You were, let's see, around 15 or 16 when, when the swing era, I mean, they supposedly say that Benny Goodman's performance at the Palomar Ballroom kind of launched the swing era. It seems like I've read this a lot of times. But maybe it was going on before then. Well, let me see. When I started to play, what, you know, what I call, considered what I liked, which was swing, uh, I was young enough or old enough to be playing these dance places with trios and not about a quartet, a trio, anyhow. We'd play in some of these, uh, not barns, but uh, there'd be an upstairs to a uh, an actual dance hall, and we'd have a trio, and they, these people be doing all this great stuff that we see later as mm -hmm. the, you know, the all these great dances like the Lindy Hop and the, you name it. Right. And that was it was great to just play with a trio because I had heard Benny, uh -huh. and I was playing like Benny, and they were just 
So you had yourself and a piano and a drummer? Yeah, I think so, yeah. yes, at that time. Uh, actually, from that, I, and I don't, I'm trying to remember the, the, the timeline there. Because for a while there, I had a little group. I, I must have been quite a bit beyond that, uh, where I had the trio. We had a cooperative quartet, accordion, jazz accordion, great jazz accordion player, Pete Sacaponte, and a guitar and a bass. And there were three or four others of the same combination at the same time. Uh -huh. There's, a, as a matter of fact, an article. I should have brought that. I only found this one, but mm -hmm. there I know it's home somewhere. Uh, regarding these four outfits, and one of them turned out to be a very good friend of mine, the guy Bob Manners, who had a, one of these groups. There was Joe Mooney. I don't know if you remember that name. He used to sing and play the accordion. Mm -hmm. And I'm trying to think of the fourth. I don't remember, but there were at least four uh, groups of that ilk. Yeah. But before that was the basic swing. Mm -hmm. So by the time you were in your late teens, you, had, you decided that I'm going to be a musician. Yes. This is my career. That right was here. it. Especially when people you know, tell you you, uh, you play pretty good, so I figured you know, uh, none of the other kids could do that. Uh -huh. I figured I better stay with this. Yeah. If they think I can do it, well, that's what I did. What was the average pay for a, a gig like that you've been describing at that time? Uh, truthfully, I don't remember the exact pay for the trio things I was talking about, uh, but I remember getting started in, in the dance, diamond dance halls, and that was $15 for the week. 15 a week? 15 a week, and we would play, I think, till. Gosh, I think it was something like, it was quite a late gig. I think it was from 10 to 2 or 10 to 4, or one of those late things, $15 a week. But that's where I learned how to play, because mm -hmm. there were about, let's say, five or six people, maybe in, I really can't remember the exact number, but a dance would be a chorus, maybe two choruses of a tune, and then when we stop, they'd have to get a new partner. I'm glad you brought this up, because I really want you maybe to describe that so I'm, I'm sure that, was there an, uh, an area where they could come in to dance yes. and they had to either buy a ticket They'd or? Buy, there's a place where they would buy tickets, either okay. get 10 tickets, some guys would like one girl, they'd give her 10 tickets and they'd do 10 dances. I see. So they would have her for the 10, 10 tunes or whatever we played. I don't remember it was exactly, it was some, probably one chorus. But so it was, we, didn't last too long. Didn't last too long. One chorus, <laughs> but then, as you know, we had to do a lot of, learn a lot of tunes, so. because in one chorus, maybe it was my turn to play mm -hmm. a chorus, uh, the next fellow's play the turn, and we'd all try to learn all the tunes. That was the yeah. way I learned most of the tunes of that era. Yeah. And they would buy their tickets, one or two or, or ten, go to the girl they chose, and uh, that was it. Suppose you got, were getting a request, or getting lots of requests for some particular tune, um, Moonlight in Vermont or something, and, and you didn't know it. Like the next day, what, where would you go to learn it at that time? Well, hopefully one of the guys would know it and he would teach it to me. Okay. I don't think I went to books. Nowadays they have, you know, yeah, they have. I have a pile of right. things where no matter what you say, I, I'm pretty sure I have it covered. Mm -hmm. But then you would, one of the guys would probably know it because they were fairly good musicians, as I remember, and I would ask the pianist or whoever, hey, I just got a request for so-and-so, do you know the tone, you know, the, you know, the changes? And he'd say yes or no, and I'd go to the next guy until we found somebody who knew it. Uh huh. And <coughs> that's the way I went about it. Tell me about um, Kelly's stable in New yes, York. Yes, that's the first big thing we ever did. And that was the Kelly stable was that quartet I told you about. Mm -hmm. It was Pete Sacrapani, jazz accordion player. Sid, 
I don't know if it was Sid Jacobs on bass, and I can't remember the guitarist. Very nice guitar player. It, it escapes me. But that was a quartet we had opposite Coleman Hawkins. When he made his triumphant return, uh, this is after, I think after Body and Soul. Uh -huh. He came to New York from wherever, in Europe, and we were the uh, opposite band. I, I didn't realize who he was till we got into the place, and they said, would you like to, you know, play the, the other thing? And Coleman Hawkins was the, you know, the big, yeah. big star. And that was our introduction to uh, the jazz of 52nd Street. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was great because uh, we were right into it all of a sudden, 52nd Street, and we're playing jazz and Coleman Hawkins. And, and you were how old? Well, then about, must have been about 18, almost between 18 and 19 Jeez. then. By then I was, hmm. I was experienced. Boy, I was really <laughs> 18, I think, because I went with Les Brown at the end of 19, almost 20, because I made Mexican Hat Dance. It was uh, my first recording with Les. Mm -hmm. Big recording. I was almost 20, I think it was 19, uh, 18 and a half. So this must have been a year before I joined Les, so it's got to be, I must have been almost 18. Yeah. Um, 52nd Street must have been a marvelous place to be. Well, it, they had uh, these places very close to each other. You could go from one to the other and hear you know, Billy Holiday or uh, whatever. And uh, I remember I'm trying to uh, tell it the correct way because then it wasn't illegal to smoke pot. Mm -hmm. And I remember people in the audience, like some of these stars and some of the uh, publishers would be sitting at the bar doing their thing. And this was before I even uh, thought about it or knew about it. Of course, I never inhaled, but <laughs> okay. they didn't either. You know? Right. <laughs> but it was amazing when I found out later what they were doing, not too much later, but I found out that that's mm -hmm. what was going on. And it wasn't, it was very, uh, it wasn't Can against the law. Yeah. Everybody was doing it, you know. Mm -hmm. And then it became a thing. So, did it, did it affect the players, the music, the way they played? Do you think? I think so. I think it affects. Uh, a lot of people say no, but uh, I don't know if there's proof uh, that uh, it affects you either way. But a lot of people who play under the influence uh, think they play better. And then uh, I don't know if I've listen to people who think they're playing good and you find that uh, it's not quite as clean as they th I don't mean clean. As they'd like to be, yeah. Uh, uh, not what they think they're doing. Mm -hmm. I, so I think there is a little discrepancy, although most of them did great. Mm -hmm. You know, I, uh, I never really thought about uh, listening to people uh, when they're smoking pot uh, and trying to decide, because I'd never heard them without it, so right. I couldn't tell the mm -hmm. difference. Um, when you were, were you playing uh, saxophone at this time also? Yes. Just before, and then I you got just, into Les Brown as an yes. alto and clarinet yes. player. Yes, alto and clarinet. Yeah. You also did some singing too, didn't you? Well, that's... Shall we lose it as a use, loose term? Uh, it's a loose term. Uh, all I did was, for instance, uh, Doris Day was on the band, the first band. Uh, I was on with Les, and they needed somebody to do a little something like, uh, uh, the night is young. Da 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 It's, 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 I would say it's. And she did all the rest, you know. It's delightful, it's delicious, it's lovely. And I'd just stand there and say it's. So that was the extent of my... Uh, except that when we did, uh, we did some things like uh, Alexander is a swoos, and I remember, I still don't remember, I don't remember what I said on Alexander is a swoos, but uh, Joe DiMaggio, 
uh, Jolton Joe DiMaggio, you remember he had a big uh, streak, uh, hitting streak, 60 oh, some yeah. games. Yes. So they wrote a tune, Joe, Joe, Jolton Joe DiMaggio, we want you on our side. So the band used to yell and I used to make up little things like that. I wasn't the only one, somebody would say, hey, why don't we say so and so. Right. And little things like that. So uh -huh. just a couple of, yeah. and all that meat and no potatoes, I remember yelling at the end of a record. Da, 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 all that meat and no potatoes. You know, that was my, that was my big contribution to jazz. <laughs> that's, a good, uh, that's a good story. Do the, the bands um, needed to have some kind of uh, uh, gimmick at yep. that time to be competitive with one another? Yes, well, Les was a, uh, it was mainly uh, a hard swing band, I thought, and uh, what he tried to do was take some of the uh, classical things, like March Slav, Mexican Hat Dance, and uh, things like that, mm -hmm. which fortunately I had some clarinet solos to play in those, and they, he, he did quite well with those. And then uh, he wrote Sentimental Journey, which is still going. But I think the fellow who really wrote Sentimental Journey was Ben Homer, mm -hmm. who was the, our head arranger for a while. And uh, less, as all leaders do, uh, put his name on it. I don't know if he, if you're listening, Les, I don't know if you added anything to that or not, but I know your name was on it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and Doris, Doris Day sang that, right? Yes. 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 Yeah. As a sideman in that band, uh, what we usually, a recording session would be uh, done in a day, two days for, of course you were cutting sides at the time, right? You were cutting yes. two sides for what, a record. Yes. Uh, truthfully, you know, I know what they do now. I know, I know what we did when I was at the studios for 20th Century Fox. But at that time, I truthfully don't remember what the uh, uh, time, uh, you know, the, the lapse time was, whether it was two hours, three hours, or wait till we do two sides and we'll quit. And I don't, that's funny, I don't remember that part. Mm -hmm. But I know we did, we did quite a few, you know, uh, uh, tunes, and I really can't, and that, that evades me. Mm -hmm. I can't remember how long we recorded each session. But it became, uh, the standard became three hours. Yeah. Because that's what the scale is based on, you know, as of the last 25, 30 years. Were you, by the time you were with Les Brown and they'd had that Mexican hat dance and so forth, did your parents, uh, were they proud of you? Oh, yes. And what you were doing? Oh, yes. I brought them along. Even before that, I brought them along to hear, I used to go after school, uh, to hear Benny Goodman at the Hotel in Pennsylvania. That was one of the places uh, to go to hear uh, the bands. And I used to listen at the door, outside the door when Benny was playing. So I don't know how this came about, but we wound up Benny joining us at a table at the Hotel Pennsylvania. I'm pretty sure that's what it was. I have a picture to that effect. I should have wow. brought that. But the whole family, all my sisters and brothers, mom and dad, and there we were at the table, Benny and I and the whole family. So that was, uh, I mean, we weren't that close. He, uh, the only thing he ever would ask me is what kind of reed are you using, and that's it. Uh, because he was into music and that's all he did. Yeah. Always searching for the perfect reed. Yes. <laughs> yeah, funny, funny stories about him having reeds all around him and uh, having one of the fellows come by and pick up one of them. And, blowing it, it sounded pretty good, he'd say, hey, give me that. <laughs> he had just discarded it, you know. <laughs> there are a lot of little stories like that. <laughs> there are a multitude about yeah. Benny. Yeah. Funny. What was a military stint like for you? Uh, it was one of the most gratifying, and I'm, uh, I'm sorry to say nicest, supposed to be you know, in the military and I just had a ball because I learned how to 
right uh, out of range, and I learned how to play flute from one of the fellows in the mm -hmm. band, and it was great. Great, um, there were great musicians from the West Coast. That's what enabled me to come out and mm -hmm. go to the 20th Century Fox. After I, after the service, which was about three and a half years from uh, 42 to the middle of 45, mm -hmm. I went back, nothing much was happening. We did a little something, then I came back here. And pretty soon the, uh, Oh, I went back with Tommy in 46, not back with Tommy, back with Les. Tommy was first. In 46, uh, my wife Gussie and I decided to get married, and we were on the road for a year with Tommy Dorsey, and then that would have been 47, and then a little kidding around, I think we went back to New York for a while. Then I went back with Les uh, from about 48 to 50, and in 50, these fellows what I had met in the, the war uh, at Santa Ana, as a matter of fact, that's where we were stationed. Uh, they asked us, there were three of us, they asked us to see if we wanted to come to Fox. And it was Frank Beach, the first trumpet. Uh, this is when they, what they needed. First trombone would, uh, was Ray Klein and the jazz clarinet player. Hmm. So they asked three of us from the Les Brown Band they came to the Palladium one night, and the upshot was, would you like to come to Fox? So uh -huh. that was my entree to Fox Studios. What was it like traveling on the road with a big band at those, in those days? In those days, uh, each band was a little bit different. Uh, the, the two that I can talk about, Les Brown and Tommy, Les Brown used to uh, go from place to place using individual cars. We'd have uh, two or three or four people in a car. Uh, with Tommy, as I remember, it was bus because it was a larger group. Uh, he had a string ensemble as well as a jazz group, which was very nice. We used mm -hmm. to, uh, and that was really the highlight uh, for me up to that point. And then I went back with Les, which was a whole new, different thing. Uh, there is different feelings, but always with less it was by car. Yeah. Traveling by car. And then the camaraderie, of course, was always great. Uh, and that uh, if you latched on to people that you liked, and usually I like everybody, so it was, hopefully it was uh, reversed as well. <clears throat> Did the musicians in the swing bands uh, have any resent? towards the vocalists because it was it necessary to have a vocalist you know to sell the music uh, I think the feeling against vocalists has, has always been widespread ever since the beginning of and yeah you know they always say well they're taking up my time which is really uh, they don't they're not against the vocalist I think it's if the vocalist sings, then we don't get a chance to play. Because mostly the people who are in the dance bands are uh, not frustrated, but they're jazz players who want to play the horn. Right. Right. And th that cuts out a whole chorus when somebody could have played. Mm -hmm. So that's the only reason I think they didn't dislike vocalists. I think that's the reason. And thinking about it now, I'm just coming up with that in that I think that was the main reason, mm -hmm. that they didn't get a chance to play. Of course, some of the vocalists weren't that great. Maybe that helped, yeah. too. <laughs> yeah. Because, <laughs> you know, some of the people, Doris Day, you know, was very nice. Uh, but m most of the others were, you know, band vocalists. And uh, I don't want to say anything derogatory about band vocalists, but they were they were that was the, their job was to sing a chorus and most of them were very good mm -hmm. as I remember 1946 um, a whole slew of big bands called it quits yes did you see that coming as a as a side man and did it affect what you wanted to do your a choice of career at that point well, no path? because that's when I joined Tommy Dorsey uh, 1945, 
I'm sorry, 19, yeah, 1945, I was out of the Army. I was in New York with a quartet like I described earlier with the accordion, mm -hmm. bass, and drums. We tried to knock around Long Island, New York, doing casuals. I wasn't making any money, and they, I paid the guys what I could, mm -hmm. and uh, it wasn't happening. So, and then we had a little, uh, a little, uh, the Hickory House. We had a chance to go in the Hickory House, which I did. And then we did some more casuals. Now, they, I had another chance to go in the Hickory House, but I was already practically packed and on my way to the coast. And uh, I figured to go through what I had already gone through just to stay at the Hickory House, which was, uh, it's as, that's as far as I can go. I, I yeah. better go somewhere. So I came to the coast and uh -huh. wound, wound up going with Tommy Dorsey. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that, that was the, the time I decided to make the move out and stay mm -hmm. here. Yeah. And we stayed, uh, went with Tommy Dorsey and then back with Les and then back right. into the studio. Was, what was it like to work for Dorsey? Was he a pretty That's demanding great. leader, nice guy? No, well, it was, he was very demanding before I got there. Uh, from what I understood, he was on all kinds of things like turpentine, hydrate, and codeine, mm -hmm. which was anything to get him uh, high. A certain, uh, I don't know truthfully what that does to you, but he had been on that, which was bad. But when we got there, Gussie and I, uh, he was calm, he was off all that stuff, very nice. He was married to Pat Dane, uh, who was showgirl, mm -hmm. and we used to play cards, and everybody was Everybody was happy. It was one of the happiest times of my life. Great. Here I was with a big band, and I found out later that uh, the only drag was I was making less money than Buddy DeFranco, who I replaced. Uh -huh. And when I found that out, I said, what the hey, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but it worked out okay. Yeah. Well, you got out here of, gee, as things have changed dramatically. Boy, you're talking about now. When, what uh, what time period you're talking you're about? You're talking about you came out here in 1949 or oh, 50. Oh, uh, the very first time with less than 38. Oh, I yes. mean, just before we, I did those recordings with them uh, right. back mm -hmm. east. This is one of the stops we made. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess we played the Palladium stuff like that. So that was the earliest. Then we came out the second time. Uh, that was also a Palladium uh, stop, and that's when they asked us uh, to join Fox mm -hmm. Studios. But uh, quite a quite a change, yes. Mm -hmm. Then the uh, and there were studio orchestras, which I was now part of the 20th Century Fox Band, which was a complete orchestra, like 50 to 60 to 70, even more people, and each independent studio. I don't mean independent. MGM had its own orchestra, <coughs> uh, 20th Century Fox, Universal, uh, Warner Brothers, you name it. Every Columbia, each studio had its own orchestra, and they were all great. And each orchestra was under contract, and everybody in the orchestra was had a weekly salary. It was a, the best of all worlds mm. at that time, and it was, I fortunately fell into it after uh, I had been w uh, with Les Brown for a yeah. while. So I lucked out. I was in the right place at the right time. Your reading skills have to be pretty sharp for that kind of gig. Is yes. Right? Well, we, being with Les and with Tommy, uh, I had studied, of course, uh, in the interim, and I, uh, uh, the reading thing came along with playing all the new charts yeah. in both bands, Plass and Tommy. And fortunately, I guess, it stayed with me. But a lot of people, uh, when they get into jazz, forget about the reading. And it, it did me in good stead because I could read fairly quickly and acclimate to what mm -hmm. was happening. So I lucked out that way, too. Yeah. I just happened to remember what the notes were. <laughs> So a typical day at 20th Century Fox, uh, 
you're, you're talking working days now instead of yes. late nights. Oh, some nights, not uh, late nights. Yeah. For instance, if you do a picture, let's say they called you in at 9, so you'd work from 9 to 12, go out and have lunch, come back at, let's say, 2, 2 to 5. That usually, that about it. Uh, sometimes you'd have to finish a picture, you'd come back at 7. Everybody got loaded, and no, nobody could see the music, but it was okay, and we had some fun that night. So, but that was occasionally. Yeah. Most of the time during the day, well, we had, we had at least five clarinets, and we had wow. two, three oboes. You know, it was a large orchestra. And so if I couldn't come one day, that was, as a matter of fact, I, during uh, my, one of my wife's pregnancies, I went to work. And they said uh, they happened to have a call for a clarinet and so maybe three woodwinds. I said, what are you doing here? Your wife is in the hospital, isn't she? I said, yeah, I got a call. I said, get out of here. Call Chuck. Have him come in. You go to the hospital. You know. So I remember that one because uh, I didn't know enough to ask him, to, could I go to the hospital, you know, see what's happening, right. what's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> what came out, by the way? Uh, and that time, it <laughs> might have been my first, because that's why I didn't ask. Right, you didn't know that. I didn't know any better. Uh, Cam, Cameo, Cameo Barbara, her name is. Uh -huh. uh, that was my oldest daughter. Uh -huh. It was now 50-some. Yeah. Uh. Did you ever witness any uh, <clears throat> arrangers uh, coming in with music that the producers just didn't care for? Oh, yes. There were lots of scores thrown out. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the uh, one that I personally remember, Earl Hagen is a very is a buddy of mine. Mm. He was a great writer, and he, you know, he did, uh, you know, uh, uh, Harlem Nocturne. Did Harlem Nocturne was his first piece. He wrote it when he was like 15 years old. <laughs> you know, was, I just worked for him by, in Palm Springs. As a matter of fact, mm. he has. A, he belongs to a club, club called Morningside, and he gets some little quartets. Invited me with my quartet to play this last month. But he uh, brought an arrangement in for Barbara Streisand once, and uh, Earl was at the top of his form. Barbara Streisand just didn't like it, threw the whole thing out. And he was about the second or third that she had discarded. Hmm. And that, to me, was strange because I thought Earl would, could do anything for anybody and never got a, never got a chart discarded. But it happened with her. She was very, very meticulous, and she would pick what she wanted, and very successfully, you know. She mm -hmm. can't say that she's wrong, because she knows evidently what she's doing. But there were others, I remember, pictures that we would finish, and uh, I'd hear the next day or two days later the producer said, forget it, let's get somebody else. Mm. Redo that. So there were, there were lots of things like that. Yeah, I don't know about lots, but uh, there were quite, uh, there were a few while I was at Fox mm -hmm. where that happened. When they did a movie score, were you, they um, would the conductor watching the the picture on a screen? Yes. And did you all have? Uh, we all had earphones. Yeah, click, click click track. track. One of the first people to do the click track thing and the. Uh, I forgot what they call it. It's they scratch the screen. Well, they stripe it. Stripe, stripe it, it somehow. Yes, uh, I'm glad you said that. Yeah. Uh, so that when the conductor looks at it, it goes from the left side of the screen to the right, and when it goes from here to there, this is all you know, striped. So that when it hits this, that's when somebody got hit or the car does something. So he goes when it's uh, bump, he knows when that's happening. Al Newman was the first, one of the first ones to do that. And the click tracks were developed while I was at the studios. So that no matter where uh, you are, uh, as far as uh, the rhythm type of thing, throughout the piece, let's say, uh, I should say this a different way. The click tracks were so that you could tell exactly what was happening all through the scene. It might be 64 seconds. Uh, the click track could be broken up 
so that at uh, 15 seconds you could think this happens and this happens. Mm -hmm. And these conductors got very, very good at it. And one of the best was Hank Mancini, who used to write within these click tracks and write jazz. So that, dun, dun, ba, dun, ba, ba, and that's something that happened there. Yeah. And he would do it musically. Yeah, it was one of the greatest of all. Hank Mancini was really yeah. one of the greatest yeah. as far as writing jazz to uh, the screen uh, with the click tracks. Uh -huh. It was really terrific. I enjoyed, always, always enjoyed his scores. I'll bet. I would have think that that um, is a pretty high pressure situation. Both yes. The, for the conductor and the musicians, did you ever have a occasion where you really did a clinker and they had to do it over? Well, <laughs> uh, no, a clinker, of course now a clinker can be cleared up so yeah. quickly with the digital and all that, there's no problem. But then it did happen, so you'd, you'd probably do it over, but it wasn't no, it wasn't like, oh my gosh, I yeah. hit a clinker, you just admit it unless he didn't hear it. <laughs> Sometimes they didn't hear it, then you could say, uh, you know, I got away with that one. It's there but, for posterity. <laughs> yeah, but most of the people, most of the guys could read well. Uh -huh. And if they did goof something, the thing would just stop and then would start all over again. Yeah. So there was no problem that way. Mm -hmm. But nowadays, they just, oh, you missed bar four? Okay, let's do bar four. And the guy goes Ch -ch -ch, uh, with the uh, mm -hmm. digital. Start at bar three, da -da 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 -da, bah, and you got the correct note in there. You can have a perfect performance every time. That's wild. It is. Do you like it? Do you, do you like the, oh, I'm not sure how to ask this. The change being in, able to, the, being change able in to the technology, has it improved the music? Uh, yes and no. It might not be as, what would it be? Uh, uh, when you improvise something, the first time it could be sensational or it could be lousy. Those first time sensational uh, takes that could be once in a lifetime might not happen because if somebody is, uh, uh, then again, it could be that it, it, it could be that the fellow playing could be relaxed so much knowing that you could fix it uh -huh. that he wouldn't be, you know, he'd be just cool it. Right. And, you know, I, I don't know. See, I, I'm trying to say it could or could not. In other words, if I knew I could fix something, so I'd go ahead and do it, but would not without the, with the intensity of trying right. to make a good take the first time. Yeah. But knowing that I, you know, fix it. No. You kind of got that back door there, and yeah. so maybe you're not playing with the same intensity that yeah. you might normally. Yeah, that's what I, that's what I'm yeah. feeling. Yeah. It might or might not uh -huh. work. I read this strangest little anecdote in the. I have the Leonard Feather book from the '60s. <laughs> I've never seen a little piece like this. It's, the one sentence it said about you, it said, "Uses plastic reeds when playing jazz." <laughs> It's, what a funny thing to put in there. Well, <laughs> you know, Artie Shaw used plastic for a long time. And I, I didn't, at one stage, I didn't care who knew it. As a matter of fact, since uh, about 20 years ago now, Arnold Berlhart made a reed for me, mm -hmm. which was made out of synthetic. Synthetic. I don't, I don't like to call it plastic That's because it's right. a little kinder. Yeah. So I use it, and everybody since has asked me where they can get them. Because mm -hmm. I get a, my own clarinet sound and it's clarinet. But I hate to look for cane reeds. So I'm with you. what I do is these reeds will last anywhere from, uh, gosh, this latest one is four years at least. God. And it goes on. For, I've heard of some, uh, Arnold didn't make these, but uh, people blow them for 20 years. No. Well, I use them myself, so. Really? Yeah. <laughs> so. I, do, I wouldn't use anything else because I like the sound uh -huh. and uh, on a clarinet for me, and I can pick it up and blow. Yeah. And I can get the high notes. I have to do Artie Shaw. I need the high B for Stardust or whatever. Mm. It pops out. If I had a cane read, I go, <laughs> and nothing. 
what happened, so why knock my brains out? It's hard enough to, to do with, uh, yeah. you know, when you got all the tools. But these things, as a matter of fact, I remember, just to give you an, an example about the strength of these reeds, I had this reed, and uh, it was starting to, the edge was starting to get a little frail. I spoke to Arnold, who was, was a very good friend of mine, who was a saint for me. He just saved my life. I call him my doctor, Arnold Brillhout. You remember the name? Yes, absolutely. And so he had made me a few reeds. Now, this one was, I liked this one, and it was starting to fray. He said, just cut the tip off and start shaving. And don't worry about left side, right side, like you do with cane. Uh -huh. He said, forget about it. Just start doing this. <laughs> so I, one day, I had a recording to do in two days. So I decided, okay, I'm going to clip it. And I clipped it, and I had a, my clipper was kind of, well, I had to use a vise to, to <laughs> clip this thing. Now I had a thick, thick <laughs> end, right? So I put the reed down on something, I don't know, and I started doing this, and I blew, I was one, you know, nothing. So all day I would do this. Finally, I got, uh, I just got a little bit of a sound. One day later, I was still doing this, and eventually I got, ooh, I got a little sound. And at the end of the second day, I had to record the next day. I kept doing this, and I, the, the reed came back. Arnold was right. He said, just keep doing that, and you'll get a reed. <laughs> what were you shaving with? Oh, a 400 wet dry black sandpaper. <laughs> That's wild. And just do that. Man, how could he make any money selling reeds the last they couldn't. five well, years? <laughs> I used to, uh, I, I had a deal with, it was funny, of course, the owner uh, fellow who at the time was the CEO of Rico, which is, mm -hmm. was his company, uh, I had a deal with him, a dollar a year. It was like one of those, I'll pay you a dollar a year for these reeds that Arnold made. And I used to go in once a year and pay him a dollar. <laughs> so that I could, so I could use Arnold's reeds. And everybody now wants them, but I, um, uh, I only have enough for, if I last to a, uh, age 120, I have just enough. Okay, well, you should hold on to it. Because <laughs> you're looking pretty good. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, can we talk about the, um, the Time Life oh, sure. Swing Series? Uh, that was a funny start to that. Gus Pavona, a very dear friend of mine, excellent clarinet player, mm -hmm. started that. He did Begin the Begin and a couple of others. And a funny thing happened. He brought a friend in who had done the great John L. I forgot what his name is. Do you remember? There was an actor who played the great John L. Anyhow, he was a friend of uh, uh, Gus. Mm -hmm. He brought him in, and somehow the fellow started talking during the recording. And the fellow in the booth who uh, started this whole thing, oh my gosh, I can't remember. Uh, Kavanaugh. Oh, Dave Kavanaugh. Dave Kavanaugh, yeah. who started, took exception to what the guy was saying. Oh. And he fired Gus oh. and uh, sh sh uh, told this guy to leave and don't come back. Wow. So they called me. <laughs> Otherwise, I never would have been, I have to mention that because I know he did it because he was closer to the people involved than I was. And the people who recommended me was, were Manny Klein, Marion Klein. They happened to know me, and uh, I was in the Army with Manny Klein. Mm -hmm. So that was one good thing from the yeah. Army. And I started doing all those. And what they did was send me, they would decide which tunes they would do for the week. We would do two or three. And uh, if it was cl all clarinet stuff, they would send me little uh, 45s with the particular tune on it. Mm -hmm. in, in which the solo, clarinet solo, happened. And then I would study that. And then on Monday, maybe we'd do this record. And Wednesday, we would do this one, and Friday, or well, whatever. And I got through all those things by listening to those and marking the phrasings. And I got very, very close to Goodman and Shaw, by, uh, or whoever else I was doing. 
by really paying attention, and I thought I really studied and made sure I marked the breath marks, strength of, uh, and uh, speed of vibrato, everything. I just marked everything on the part, and I think they came out really well. A lot of people think it's very good, but yeah. uh, you can't beat the original, let's face it. That, that was just uh, what it was for, you know, it was we had Monaro records and they wanted mm -hmm. stereo. Yeah. So what we did was get as close as we could to the original so that people could hear what that might have been had they recorded in right. the stereo. So, and I had a lot of fun because it was a learning, a learning experience for me in that uh, I found out what made them tick. Because in studying the solos, you find out what the, the fingerings they might have used, because some of the things just didn't lay there. They had to use a, oh, I use uh. this. A little bit, a little bit. The only way you can do that is to lift this finger, you know. So I, uh, you know, learned a lot. From yeah, those little something. discoveries are, are oh. quite interesting. Oh yeah. After listening to it for so many years, and all of a sudden you finally say, "Oh, that's how that's done." Yeah, because that's why I it sounds the way it does. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, going go through it the first time. How the heck did he do that? Because that he came, it came out so clear, clean, but I can't get it that clean. So. Mm -hmm. Then I found out by, you know, by kidding around and finally finding, oh, this one, uh -huh. you know, this, that came out very well. Oh. Yeah, that was uh, quite a, it was quite an undertaking for uh, those people, and it's, my only regret is that they never released them commercially here. You could get them in Europe, and you can get them, oh, wait a minute, I'll take that back, not Europe, it was, uh, what do they call that, when you order Mail order. Mail order. Yeah. Mail order, they had it that way. Yeah. Tell me about, um, I have to ask about Northern Exposure. That was a lot of fun. Uh, David, uh, David Schwartz, who was the writer, uh, that was the first time I had, not the first time I had been with some people who used synths. Now David is a bass player and used synth for whatever sounds he wanted and he used that as when he did his work he would work on the synth and then they'd say well this ought to be a clarinet and this ought to be a so-and-so and he would play me uh, when I came in he would play what he wanted on the clarinet sound, he'd say, play something like this, but you, you know, use your own style, you know, do your own thing. So, as a matter of fact, he let me, on one of these northern things, he said, well, you, I need some time, so why don't you start off with a minute of uh, noodling, so oh. he put my name down. Uh, yeah. As, you know, I don't know if I ever got any money Writing for that. Credit. But <laughs> yeah. No credit. I got, <laughs> never got any credit. <laughs> but uh, that was... It was usually one or two instruments at a time added to what he already had. For instance, if he had a piano, a synth, or a drum, a drummer would come in and play the actual thing. A lot of times the drummer came later, or a guitarist, or he'd have just three or four people in the whole mm -hmm. thing. By the time he got through, he had a whole orchestral sound. Yeah. But he didn't use large orchestras. Mm -hmm. It was a four or five, maybe. Right. Unless he had, I remember a couple of times, maybe he had, I don't know if he had a string quartet ever. Might have a couple of mm -hmm. times. But mostly he'd call me and say, I need some clarinet stuff for this guy. And usually the clarinet was the doctor. Remember that the main character initially was the Jewish doctor. Yeah. Uh, who uh, gave up. Uh, life in uh, New York. Life in New York to now to spend some time out right. here, and uh, so I was that character. So whenever the doctor, I forgot his name. I don't know why. Joel. Joel, right? Yeah. Uh, so whenever he did something, the clarinet would be playing a little uh -huh. something. So that's usually in the old days. Uh, the old days, uh, <laughs> twenty or thirty years back. Usually they would assign an instrument to a character. Al Newman. All the big composers would do that. Uh, the big pictures, they would have, well, a trumpet uh, above the orchestra signifying uh, 
a big field with a lot of dead bodies and this, you know. Yeah. It would that would be his the theme for that signature, theme, yeah. signature yeah. for that particular type of scene. But in this case, each character had an instrument that he would use. I'm talking about David mm -hmm. to uh, uh, play that particular character. So a lot of, and a lot of uh, a lot of composers did that sort of mm -hmm. thing. But in this case. And that was, I used to enjoy that show. That was yeah. very, they had great actors, actresses, uh, actors. I don't know if they want to be called actresses, actors. Uh, but it was a great show. Yeah, very quirky and. Yeah. Now it's, it's in syndication. Mm -hmm. Do you get any. <laughs> Famous, you know, uh, he, the composer gets yeah. uh, cue time. I mean, Every time a cue is played, uh, the composer gets uh, credit. I see. For instance, like uh, Mike Post, who does, uh, oh gosh, uh, there's some lawyer picture I forgot. We watch it once in a while. L.A. Law. And he, L.A. Law. It's not yeah. one of those. Right. Ba, 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 ba. That's the theme. That's all. Ba, 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 ba. Now, every time there's a chance, ba, 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 ba. I'm sure he makes a fortune, just <laughs> da, 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 da. and it gripes me because I could have done pa 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 yeah. if I had a chance. <laughs> Doesn't gripe me that he's making money, right. but what a he rant. is. He's one of those. Yeah, he's written quite a few. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's very interesting. Yeah, but David, David is a, is a bright guy, and uh, he does some nice things. David Schwartz, I'm yeah. talking about the Northern Exposure. Now this. Um, you mentioned that he used many less, a lot less people than the standard orchestras. Where's the status of the orchestra these days now in, in the film studios? Uh, there are still, let me say it this way, the, in the union there are about, I used to think there was 10,000, but I think it's about half. It's about 5,000, let's say. Of that, there's a group called the RMA, uh, Recording Musicians Association, which I'm not a member of because mm -hmm. I don't do that much work anymore. If I did, I'd probably belong to it. Uh, because those people, and there are only about, let me, let me back up. Uh, the RMA has about 1,100 members within the union, if Local 47, and that's a, 1,100 out of 5,000, even 6,000. Uh, that's a very small group. The 5,000 on the outside do all the casuals, places like this hotel, uh -huh. uh, private parties, uh, like that. But in the RMA, they have the motion pictures, TV, uh, recordings, and theater, all the high profile jobs. And only about 300, I would say, of the RMA make a good living. All the others are peripheral. It's mm -hmm. like maybe once in a while they'll get a call. Yeah. So it's boiled down to if you're in that select group and are your call if you're called by Sandy De Crescent, who is the top contractor of town, or uh, or uh, Patty De well she used to be De Carroll, Patty Zamitti, another contractor. And there are uh, two or three other lesser lights but those two are the main contractors, and if you get a call from them, then you're in. You know, it's, uh, if they start calling you. Well, they stopped calling me a while back. Maybe it's my gray hair. I don't know. <laughs> uh, usually, you know, when your contractors and leaders don't ask for you, then. Uh -huh. So I'm, I'm just facing reality in that uh -huh. nobody knows, hey, most. Uh, in within the uh, theater realm of things, and I just. I'm now doing uh, like a tribute to Benny Goodman and right. tribute to Adi Shaw, whatever. So I keep busy that way. Mm -hmm. And occasional calls. I have a call. I do some commercials and uh, a few pictures. And uh, uh, once in a while, I don't know what this one is coming up. I have something in a, a couple of weeks. So and, and, and the, in the meantime, I do some jazz gigs. So I'm right. luckily busy enough. Good. 
uh, you made a statement about your own playing that you you try to play l linearly. Linearly. Li <laughs> linearly. Thank you. <laughs> linear meaning. Li linear. Linearly. Linear lines. Yes, lines. lines. As a st instead of running the yeah. changes. Uh, most, most of the jazz players get into this. All the G's, G seven to C. Uh, with a flat nine and the flat five and all that, uh -huh. doing it that way. But I've always thought, in the, ever since I've studied, and I studied extensively with three or four uh, fine teachers, uh, different styles, and uh, I found that all of them think of the linear way to go. The lines are the strongest uh, force in music in that if you have a line and it's strong enough, it doesn't matter what uh, happens below. If you have two lines going here and you try to analyze what's happening at any particular eighth note or quarter note, it doesn't matter if these two lines are strong enough. Mm. That's Ernest Connitz, uh, Ernst Toch. Uh, Toch was uh, before Ernst Connitz. Connitz is one I studied with with Earl Hagen. Hagen recommended him. Mm -hmm for me, and I studied that for a while. As a matter of fact, I tried to write for a while, and it was just too too hectic for me. Staying up to 5 a.m. to get a score out is not my idea oh. of something to do. Yeah. So I just, not that I could ever have been that good at it, but I I thought I could. But not, not having my own time to do it mm -hmm. and having these deadlines, I figured, let me play clarinet and saxophone and flute and I'll I won't have as much mm -hmm. money as some of these guys. Yeah. But uh, did I answer your question? Yeah. Linear? Yeah. yeah. The force. Absolutely. Yeah. Now you get to play with uh, Sam yes. on occasion. Yes. That's great. As a matter of fact, we're doing, every time I do the big band thing, I have 15 men. I have uh, six brass, five saxes, and three rhythm, four rhythm sometimes when I add a guitar. And Sam uh, comes out and does a scat thing. He and I play flute and clarinet. I'm curious if uh, you you two were always good buddies. Well, uh, we were always good buddies, but we weren't close enough to find out. And uh, other, I don't mean close enough. I mean you were close what, ten years miles, uh, 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 miles. Uh huh. Uh, you know the distance yeah. between yeah. us, because for a long time he was out of New York, and I, I came out here, and he wound up going to Europe and doing, became an, he uh, was a bigger name than I ever was, uh, which is great. And then we got together out here because he moved out and I tried to do what I could with him and we, we became buddies here. Right. He's 11 years my junior and I, you know, got to take care of your brother. Yeah. So, and vice versa. So, but, so, uh, uh, we have fun. He's a, a fine player. There are a lot of things he he can do that I wish I could do. Mm. Play piano, and uh, his ears are just phenomenal. He just has some fantastic things. So I, I'm in a little different era. So when we both play, uh, a lot of people think it might not fit uh, both styles, but they do. Yeah. They, we we uh, interweave and uh, you know we each do our thing and it works. Great. Because we're both on this one, as a matter of fact. Look forward to that. I think you'll like that, yeah. yeah. Can you tell me about the, the pictures oh, yes. you brought? Did you want me to hold this up? So, uh, you want to do it later? Yeah, well, we, is, we've already taken you, a shot of them. Oh, so. good. Yeah. This is the very first album I decided to start a recording after oh, all this, uh, my, yeah. uh, my playing at Fox and stuff. Uh -huh. So this is uh, uh, myself, of course. and. Uh, uh, Monty Budwick, Jake Hanna, Sam was only on the one date, uh -huh. and uh, Hank, Jones. Hank Jones, and it was, Hank just fell right in, he was just, he says, oh, that's what you want to do, because what I did, <laughs> the first tune was, the devil, and that's what set the whole thing up, uh, these foolish things, I think, oh. these foolish things, he says, and I just played the melody, you know. And he says, oh, that's what you want, you know. He thought it was going to be bebop and all that stuff. 
just plain, oh, let's play for the people. So he's, after that, he knew exactly what we should do. Yeah. So this is that. When I had the big band, I uh, decided to go after the best, which was Martha Tilton. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the mic is in her face. Yes. But uh, <laughs> that's me on the side playing uh -huh. uh, with the big band when she was singing Angels Sing or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, these are, a friend of mine put these together for me. It shows, uh, has a, like a little background of my, mm -hmm. everything that I've done. This one is, a. Uh, I had a, went to uh, Staples and they did this picture from something I had on the wall and this is Tommy Dorsey and uh, I'm fixing my plastic reed there. <laughs> <laughs> I say plastic things and people say, why do you tell them you play plastic? I don't care. I used to, when I first got with them, uh, the new reeds, somebody, I heard somebody, uh, when I left the stand, he, said, he sounds just like a novo. I said, oh, I don't think I no, sound like a no. novo. <laughs> But any of those are all I brought. That's great. If you want me to send any more, I mean, if I can find some. Yeah, I'd love to have I'll some. See, we'll yeah. see what I've got. Um, and that's but, just the, the thing we did. This one, most mm -hmm. for your money. This is, uh, Zan Stewart is one of the f local writers who loves music. And mm -hmm. uh, this is just an article about, well, this is Frank Morocco. See, I'm back to accordion. This is a great mm -hmm. accordionist. And Jake Hanna and... Uh, they even say most. That's when we when we get around to doing it, this is what we work with. So, so you had an Abe Most Day in Los Angeles. Oh, uh -huh. you? you know something? Yeah. The Abe Most Day is uh, I forgot what day it is, but uh, they've already made a day for me. Is that? Uh -huh. Did you know yeah. that? Oh, you did. Yeah. Yeah, I That's don't remember great. what day it was, but uh, I had a you know City Hall uh -huh. Abe Most Day. All was, right. Yeah, it was something. Nice. Well, I, you know, when you get old enough, I guess <laughs> these things start coming and you don't really, at that, by then, <laughs> I wouldn't say who cares, but, you know, they, they're, they're nice, they're nice to have. And any of these other honors, which uh, I appreciate, you know, yeah. but I just like to play and right. hopefully the people like it. Well, you just said something, it, it was almost a, a, an aside. We were describing, okay, we're going to play these foolish things just about here. We're just going to play it for the people. We're not going to bop it. Yeah. Now, there's a lot in that statement, actually, that I think is, was bop music, when you're playing bop, is it more for the musicians than it is for your audience? Uh, truthfully, I never thought of playing that I was playing Bob. I, I was always a swing player. Sam, coming from this era, when he was into the Bob era, which was Charlie Parker, etc., mm -hmm. uh, it was a different, uh, different feeling entirely. I used to play a, a few figures and say, uh, well, I felt like I was playing bebop there. And he would say, yeah, that's, okay. there are a couple of uh, things there. Yeah, like, okay, big brother, you you almost made it that time, you know. Uh, but I, once in a while I would hear myself back and I'd say, two of those bars I thought a little boppy, you know. But in this, I decided, uh, let me just play the melody the way I like to play it, mm -hmm. which was I always thought I wouldn't try to improve on what Benny or Artie would, were, were doing. I would just try to move up 10 or 15 years and play my style, mm -hmm. hoping that it would, time-wise, as far as uh, style, would evolve to what I was doing. So, because I liked the swing and I liked the way the feel of Artie Shaw's music and Benny Goodman's music, they were both different, and I wanted to incorporate mm -hmm. both of them. As a matter of fact, my I thought I had uh, died and gone to heaven when they asked me to do Artie Shaw and Benny Goodman on Time Life, because uh -huh. those are my two idols. Yeah. Now, how, how much better can I do? Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me to play Artie and Benny. So. 
Great. So as far as I was concerned, I had achieved, achieved the, one of the main goals in my life. Yeah. Now I just uh, I do what I can. Yeah. Playing Sounds both. Sounds good to me. Both. Um, these particular records, I like that title, by the way. The, the most, most Abe that, Abe that, is. that was the first one we did, uh -huh. uh, and that was the uh, fellow. His name is Abe, uh, Abe uh, Ray Lawrence, who fixed this uh, record up for me. Uh -huh. And what I did on this was we had done an earlier date with an octet. When I left Tommy, this octet, which had uh, Alvin Stoller and people like that in it. Uh, Paul Smith, very good people in that octet. I didn't quite have enough music with the, the most aid that is, because they're all they're short tunes, yes. they're my tunes. Mm -hmm. So I add, decided to add them. Though now we have a, what, 60 minutes, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So that it's a decent. Uh, for CDs, yeah. For you gotta, CD, you gotta have something. You gotta have a lot. And that's, that was the first one. Then the second one was this, the Hank Jones thing. Which, call, which is called the uh, Abe Most Live. I'm sorry, that's the second one. Yeah. Abe Most, uh, the uh, Swing Lost Week Clarinet. And then this one, we were at Modellione's with this particular group, which was Ray Sherman and uh, uh, Senator Eugene Wright and uh, uh, Jack Sperling. And somebody came in with a, a nice stereo small recorder and it came out fine. Mm -hmm. I asked Willie Schwartz's uh, son, you remember Willie Schwartz sure. used to play the lead with, yeah. with uh, uh, Clay Miller? Yeah. And we were close buddies. And his son went into recording. So I spoke to his son and said, can you fix up this thing that's been recorded? Uh, this one. Uh, been <coughs> got a little tickle. Uh, was recorded on a home style thing, a very good recorder. Can you do something with the recording to clear it up and maybe take out a couple of bass choruses? Right. And he has this one of these digital things. It's a very, it's like as big, you know, the, the, his office, let's say his table, is just about this big. It's not too big. But all he does was look at this and say, I say, I, I would like to, you to get rid of the second bass chorus. And he goes, you know, this is, looks like the heartbeat, you know? He go, boom, boom. And he played for me and said, and I said, my gosh. You never that's, know. That's it. Yeah. I said, wait a minute, can you take another quarter, take another eighth note off of the first part? Mm -hmm. Because the bass sounds like it's an extra added note. He says, oh, sure. Ch -ch -ch, boom. <laughs> Boy, talk about scary. Mm -hmm. So that's digital. Yeah. And he, he, he did this, and it came out it most live. Great. <laughs> well, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. And uh, I really enjoyed talking to you. Oh, great. Did anything my, you want to add that I... My uh, introduction, you said something about bebop. My introduction to that was eye-opening. As, as well as astounding. Uh, we had just finished, after the Army, we, were, uh, we had a little group called uh, the Swing Wing, which came out of Santa Ana group, led by Milt DeLug, who's a accordion player. Mm -hmm. I, I get gravitate to accordion somehow. Uh, he was like a commercial cat. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, I was, we were, partners, 70-30. <laughs> we were partners, 70-30, right? Yeah, right. Because I was a soloist and he was. Uh -huh. So we played this thing and the, the people coming in was supposed to be Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie after us. And I, I wasn't listening to uh, the bebop stuff. But, I mean, Charlie Parker then. Mm -hmm. And uh, this fellow came up to me the last night before uh, closing night, he came up and said, uh, "Man, I dig your playing, you know." So, and uh, so I say, "Thank you very much." You know, I usually uh, uh, enjoy it when people come up and say, "I like your playing." I went in the next night, and there was Charlie Parker who said, 
I dig your plan, man, so. <laughs> that was my introduction, and I fell on the floor when I heard them play. Because uh -huh. that was the, I said, that's the, the new thing, and I don't know if I'll ever be able to play that. Because what I heard was, it just blew my mind. I just said, I better stick with Benny Goodman. <laughs> I'll never be able to make that, because he was in the, you know, what Charlie Parker was. He, God, it was so yeah. sensational. He used all the extensions of the cards, and I was still go going one, three, five, seven. And he was in the 9, 11, 13, mm -hmm. plus all the additions. Yeah. And it was just mind-boggling, really. So that was my introduction to Charlie Parker and Dizzy Gillespie. Great story. Wow. Wow. It, was something. it really yeah. was something. Well, the clarinet uh, didn't transfer to that music as much. Not Buddy quite. DeFranco was about Buddy is the only one. Yeah. And then now Eddie Daniels, who was sensational. Yeah. Uh, you know, he's just, uh, he's, you know, now he's talking about him because he's so fantastic. But I, I still like to try to swing the way Benny, Artie, both of them had that pulse, uh, which uh, very few people do nowadays. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping as long as I last, I'm going to try to swing. Yeah. Well, there's a certain amount of swing revival going on oh, right yeah. now. So. Yeah. Yeah, I hear a big bad voodoo daddy. <laughs> we had a little concert out here uh, two years ago, and they were on the bill uh -huh. as one of the featured acts. I was in one side with uh, all the swing stuff, and they were in the, let's call it the wave section where they're playing all the more modern stuff. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, this has been yeah. absolutely fascinating. Oh, I, great. I really appreciate it. I hope I've covered enough. If I think of anything else, I, I'll, I'll yell. All right. And uh, best of luck to you. I, I, I have a feeling that uh, the gigs won't run out on you. Uh -uh. <laughs> oh, no, they won't. All right. Matter of fact, I, if I can make it, I've got a gig. It's, uh, I, uh, I won't say anything about bad luck or good luck, but in 2000, I have a gig, so I'll be, I'll be 80 years old. I better make it. All right. <laughs> you signed the contract, right? I signed the contract. It's, there you that's go. set. I got to be there. All right. Well, thanks so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. No, thanks. Mm -hmm.